punctual. Thank you all very much. Familiar faces. You're all very welcome um, this afternoon. Um, and um, as you will be aware, we have a very uh, distinguished uh, guest uh, this afternoon to address us, um, Lord Carnwith, Lord Robert Carnwith, or uh, to give him his full title, which I will, if I may, say, may do so once. The Right Honourable Lord Carnwith of Notting Hill um, is our guest this afternoon. Um, Robert Carnwith uh, studied law at Trinity College, Cambridge. He was called to the bar in 1968, took silk in 1985. He served as Attorney General to the Prince of Wales, which I wasn't, I wasn't aware that the Prince of Wales had an Attorney General. I must I didn't tell get a you chance to that. ask you about that. <laughs> he did that from 1988 to 1994, um, became a judge then of the Chancery Division um, in 1994, served there until 2002, was appointed to the Court of Appeal that year, and became a Justice of the Supreme Court uh, in 2012. I think we're all uh, very familiar as well as practitioners and people with interest in environment, climate change, energy policy, with the, the body or the corpus of environmental law that is relevant and that we see litigated all the time in the Irish courts, much of it, if not pretty much all of it, coming through uh, directives from the uh, European Union and transposed into law in Ireland. So we're familiar with this territory, but it's also become a much um, bigger question in recent years as we debate and struggle with the question and the issues of climate change and how we make laws, make international agreements obviously, but how we make laws that are amenable to uh, being uh, tested and being litigated uh, by citizens, not just intergovernmental activity in other words, but citizens and NGOs and other groups can take an interest in this and perhaps drive on the agenda uh, through making new law. And I think that's maybe some of the issues that um, Robert Carnwith might uh, touch on in his uh, talk, which I'll invite him to give in just a moment before I remind you uh, to um, adjust your mobile phone. You don't have to turn it off, but if you put it to silent, um, that would be great. Um, and it would allow you also, if you're minded to do so, to tweet. And if you're going to tweet, the handle is at IIEA. So we've got about an hour. Um, as is the normal practice, the address is on the record, but when we have a Q&A session afterwards, we'll observe Chatham House uh, rules. And when you're asking questions at that point, you might just say who you are and what your background is and interest and so forth. So anyway, without any further delay, I'm delighted to invite Robert Carnworth to address us. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Well, thanks very much, Alex, for that introduction, kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be in Dublin, a great honour. Uh, I mean, you can, the, my role as uh, Attorney General to the Prince of Wales is long, unfortunately, some time ago. But for your interest, it actually is a post, one of the oldest posts. It goes back to the 14th century, when the Black Prince was fighting wars in Europe and needed an attorney to look after his affairs in, at home. Um, happily, in my case, I was appointed to a prince who was less litigious than that. And, um, but he also was very interested in the environment, which I think was one of the reasons I got appointed, because it was a time when he was actually developing his interest in environment and planning law, and I specialised in that at the bar. But anyway, here we are. I'm conscious that this subject is quite topical here. I'm, we were talking at lunch about the case you have brought by the Friends of Ireland here involving the issues of human rights and climate change, which I understand was heard earlier this year in the High Court, and you're awaiting judgment. Now, obviously, I'm not going to say anything about that, um, uh, but I'm going to start from the other, end, other side of the world in Australia, because a month ago it was announced that eight residents of the Torres Strait Islands in Australia were bringing human rights challenges against the Australian government. Now, they are a group of islands north of Queensland, home to a unique First Nation people who have inhabit inhabited the region for thousands of years. And it's one of the oldest continuous cultures in the world. And they are threatened by climate change, which is causing regular flooding of their land and homes and is predicted to get much worse. Now, the islands are within the jurisdiction of the Australian government and they complain that the government has not done enough to protect their interests, either by adopting sufficiently rigorous greenhouse gas targets 
or funding adequate coastal defences. But they're not bringing their cases under Australian law. There appear to be no suitable domestic law frameworks of legal duties and remedies. Instead, they are taking the case to the United, Na the United Nations Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now, that dates from 1966, um, and the original... Um, it said nothing about the environment. It talked about Article 27, the right to culture, Article 17, protection of family and home life, and Article 6, right to life. And those are the articles which are relied on. But, in fact, things have moved on since 1966 because a general comment on Article 6, um, which replaced previous commentaries dating from the early 80s, was issued by the committee in 2018, and it expanded on the meaning of the right to life under Article 6. And it said this, environmental degradation, climate change, and unsustainable development constitute some of the most pressing and serious threats to the ability of present and future generations to enjoy the right to life. Obligations of states' parties under international environmental law should thus inform the contents of Article 6. Implementation of the obligation to respect and ensure the right to life, and in particular life with dignity, depends on measures taken by states to preserve the environment and protect it against harm, pollution and climate change caused by public and private actors. So there's the original Article Six right to life being expanded to by by uh, the uh, commentary produced by the committee, and that's been, uh, as I understand, it, the basis of the present case. And client Earth, who are a very active uh, a non-governmental organisation, as you know, uh, has put out a frequently answered questions document, which gives a pithy summary of what the case is about. It says this, how is Australia failing on climate change? Currently, the Australian government has no policies to meet its low emissions reduction target of 26-28% by 2030. Meanwhile, Canberra has continued to push the interests of fossil fuel industries, in particular coal and coal seam gas. Last year, the UN's International Panel on Climate Change released a report stating humanity has just over a decade to introduce rapid decarbonisation of its economy to avert the worst of catastrophic climate change. So there you have in a nutshell the basic dilemma facing mankind, in fact. Now, and it's being put in the form of a complaint against the Australian government under human, international human rights conventions. But if you ask then, well, wh where's that actually going to lead in practical terms? And here... I'm afraid client earth is a little less upbeat. It goes on. When will the claim be decided? The process is quite involved and it could take up to three years for a decision. After the claim is filed on May 13th, 2019, the committee is likely to request a response from the Australian government later this year. Once Canberra responds, the authors could expect a reply from the committee in 2020 and following a potential oral hearing, a decision in 2021. So hardly a very speedy process. What would, a succession what, what would a successful decision mean legally, they ask? If successful, it would be the first decision from an international body finding that nation states have a duty to reduce their emissions under human rights law. Unfortunately, even if the committee finds that there has been a violation, it cannot force Australia to comply with its decision. However, taking a case to the committee results in international pressure on Australia and nation states do frequently comply with rulings of the Human Rights Committee. So a fairly um, modest claim as to what the, the such action should achieve. Now, of course, I say nothing about the merits of case nor what how the Australian courts might react if there were an adverse finding in the committee. But I cite it to underline a basic problem about the concept of human rights in national and international environmental law. It's one thing to assert such rights or even to establish them to the satisfaction of a tribunal. 
is quite another to convert them into action or into effective and enforceable duties at national or still less at international level. Now, as judges, we are inevitably restricted both by the cases that come before us and by the limits of the legal toolbox at our disposal. Uh, and that raises the question whether human rights law can make a significant contribution to addressing the immense uh, in the challenges we face in protecting the environment? Or is it just chipping away at the edges? Um, I was struck by this dilemma, uh, particularly a few weeks ago, when we had the Extinction Rebellion demonstration. I don't know whether you read about that. It was they, they took over Parliament Square, and um, my window in the Supreme Court looks out over Parliament Square, and so I was able to, to watch this process going on. And um, they, may, they were making a very powerful case for stronger action on environmental issues, notably climate change. And they attracted a lot of media attention, and I think did succeed in raising the political debate. But, um, in fact, they'd even gone as far as to put up a, an information tent immediately outside the entrance of the Supreme Court, which we had to negotiate coming into and out of the building. And this led to a bit of a debate amongst us whether we had any legal powers to stop them doing it. We decided they weren't doing much harm, and so there it stayed, uh, which I was quite pleased by. It seemed to me a sort of quite a good arrangement, and the police had obviously decided to take a reasonably hands-off approach. In fact, the only time that anyone sort of intervened was when one of them climbed up a tree which actually, from which you can actually look into my room. And someone was afraid that there might be secret documents on my desk, which <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint them. There was nothing of any interest at all. But uh, looking down on them, I wondered whether there was any sort of symbolism in the location of their tent. Was it a coded message to us as judges to be more proactive in holding the executive to account? Sadly, I don't think so. I think we just happened to be a convenient location opposite Parliament, which was the real focus of their attention and rightly so. But I wondered what if one of them had recognised me as a judge with a special interest in environmental law, what sort of conversation might I have had with such an activist and with how much common ground and what would I have been able to say to convince him or her of the value of what we as judges do in, 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 with the tools at our disposal. Now I'll come back to that later um, towards the end of this talk, but first I want to look at some examples of effective use of human rights law around the world. Now in some jurisdictions, the courts have been able to build on constitutional guarantees to turn such rights into effective action. In the famous Opposa case in 1993, the Philippines Supreme Court described rights to a balanced and healthful ecology as, quote, basic rights which predate all governments and constitutions and need not be written in the constitution for they are assumed to exist from the inception of humankind. The court memorably upheld a challenge to the state's policies for granting consents to fell in the country's virgin forests brought by some 43 children from all over the Philippines on behalf of themselves and, quote, generations yet unborn. Now that was 1993. It was a very progressive decision which has been often cited and in some cases followed. In the same spirit, the courts of India and Pakistan have taken the lead in interpreting constitutional guarantees of the right to life to include environmental rights. In the words of the Pakistan Supreme Court in the leading case of Shalad Zia uh, in 1994, they said the right to life quotes, does not mean nor can it be restricted only to the vegetative or animal life, or mere existence from conception to death. Life includes all such amenities and facilities which a person born in a free country is entitled to enjoy with dignity, legally and constitutionally. And that approach has been adopted in a number of, well, particularly India, but also a number of other uh, South Asian jurisdictions with, with strong effects. And a well-known and very powerful example of the potential of this approach is the case of Leghari and the Attorney General in the Lahore High Court in 2015. The court was faced with a claim by a farmer whose land was suffering from the effects of climate change 
and who charged the government with failure to implement its own climate change policies. The court upheld the claim, relying again on the constitutional right to life. It ordered the setting up of a climate change commission to oversee the implementation of those policies under the supervision of the court. And the commission has recently submitted its final report following successful completion of the main phases of its work. Now that's an extraordinary activist approach for the court to set up a, a commission to do the work of actually bringing government to account in a practical way. Um, but of course it was important to the success of that case that the court was not seeking to impose on the government anything to which it was not already in principle committed. It was simply seeking to hold the government to its own policies. And no doubt for this reason the government did not appeal the decision but cooperated fully in the work of the court appointed commission. So um, that is a powerful example of the way one can use uh, human rights or constitutional guarantees of human rights but working with the government. Now I think the South Asian courts have gone much further than would be thought as yet appropriate for common law or civil courts in other parts of the world including our own. In Europe part of our legal toolbox is the European Convention on Human Rights. Now as you know the convention itself says nothing about the environment. Um, we were discussing at lunch actually the wreath lectures given recently by my former colleague Jonathan Sumption and he pointed out the extent to which Article 8 of the Convention has been expanded to cover all sorts of things which probably weren't in the minds of the original drafters, one of them being the protection of the environment. Um, Jonathan has sort of emphasised the dangers of the expansion of the law into areas better left, in his view, to political resolution. As he put it, quotes, human rights are where law and politics meet. It can be an unfriendly meeting. Uh, and he quoted our former Prime Minister's comment that a recent decision of the European Court of Human Rights about votes for prisoners made him, quotes, physically sick. But that was slightly extreme. And happily, I'm not aware of any comparable political reaction to decisions of the Strasbourg Court relating to the environment. And I think this is because the court has in practice stared a careful line between the protection of individual rights and the margin of appreciation allowed to the government on policy issues. Two cases illustrate the contrast. The first significant environmental case in Strasbourg was called Lopez Ostra against Spain in 1995 where the court upheld a complaint about the Spanish government's failure to deal with smells, noise and fumes from a waste treatment plant situated a few metres away from the uh, claimant's home. She had put up with it for three years before having to move. It was held that there was a violation of Article 8 as the authorities had not struck a fair balance between the town's economic well-being and her private life. And there had been effect a total failure by the government to respond to a serious and unlawful interference with her home life. At the other end of the spectrum is the leading Grand Chamber case relating to night flights at Heathrow, Hatton and the United Kingdom in 2002. Now there there was no doubt about the sleep interruptions caused by night flights and the third section of the court had initially upheld the claim by a majority but the Grand Chamber disagreed. The difference turned on the view taken of the margin of appreciation and whether the regulations reflected a fair balance. Previous cases such as Lopez Ostra were distinguished on the basis that quote, the violation was predicated on a failure by the national authorities to comply with some aspect of the domestic regime whereas this element of, of quotes, domestic irregularity is wholly absent in the present case. Overall it was said the court does not find that in substance the authorities overstepped their margin of appreciation by failing to strike a fair balance between the right of the individuals affected by those regulations to respect for their private life and home and the conflicting interests of others and of the community as a whole. It's interesting that my colleague Lord Kerr who had been sitting as an ad hoc judge in the 
chamber decision and had dissented for reasons very close to those of the Grand Chamber. Uh, he observed that a central problem in such cases is to define the boundaries between the respective roles of policy makers and courts. He said this, if convention stands are not met in an individual case, it is the role of the court to say so, regardless of how many others are in the same position. But when, as here, a substantial proportion of the population of South London is a similar, in a similar position to the applicants, the court must consider whether the proper place for a discussion of the particular policy is in Strasbourg, or whether the issue should not be left to the domestic political sphere. Now, um, similar issues, I think, are at the heart of the arguments in the famous Urgenda case in the, ne the Netherlands. Uh, that was a case brought by the Dutch Urgenda Foundation and, uh, and a number of citizens to compel the government to comply with its Kyoto commitments. Uh, and it was held by the court and wasn't really contested that the government had not limited uh, emissions to the extent which they had undertaken to do in previous international conferences. Uh, uh, the district court, the Hague District Court, which heard the case first, rejected arguments that these were purely political issues. It held that given the undisputed evidence as a serious threat to man and the environment posed by climate change, and even without specific legislation, the government had to, a duty to take appropriate mitigation measures in its own territory to address it. Now, the district court put its decision on a slightly esoteric um, feature of Dutch law called unlawful hazardous negligence, which I don't think is repeated in our system or I suspect yours. But the Court of Appeal um, last year upheld that decision on grounds of more general interest because they based their decision on the European Convention and in particular on Articles 2 and 8. They held that climate change represents a real threat resulting in the serious risk that the current generations of citizens will be confronted with loss of life and or a disruption of family life. And that under Articles 2 and 8 of the Convention, the state has a duty to protect against this real threat. Now that has rightly been treated as a landmark case in its recognition that the threat posed by climate change can be seen as a human rights issue. Uh, we are currently awaiting the result of the government's appeal to the Supreme Court. And um, the, uh, the argument in which was heard recently. But um, one has to accept that Articles 8 and, uh, of the Convention um, really are not very well adapted to protection of environmental rights. On any view, it is a significant limitation on those provisions that Article 8 is about the protection of people and their homes and families rather than of the environment for its own sake. This is a point that came up in a case called Kurtatos against Greece in 2005 where the applicants had challenged the government's failure to demolish buildings um, in where permits to build on a swamp had been ruled unlawful by the Greek court. The first section held that there was no violation of Article 8, as the applicants had not shown how damage to birds and other protected species directly affected their own private or family rights. The court observed... Neither Article 8 nor any other of the Articles of the Convention are specifically designed to provide general protection of the environment as such. To that effect, other international instruments and domestic legislation are more pertinent in dealing with this particular aspect. Now, as that passage implicitly recognises, environmental rights are not human rights in the ordinary sense. They are much more than that. They involve rights and duties. The rights of those of not just humans, but of all living things. The duties are ours as a species which has the unique ability to influence the environment for good or ill. But it's not at all clear that we yet have in place, quotes, other international instruments fit for the purpose. A more comprehensive view of the scope of environmental rights and duties is found in the important decision 
in February 2018 of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in its advisory opinion at the request of the Republic of Colombia concerning state obligations in relation to the environment. Again, the original version of the American Convention on Human Rights, dating from 1969, said nothing about the environment. Article 26 merely imposed a general obligation for the progressive development of, quote, economic, social and cultural rights. It was not until the El Salvador Protocol of 1989 there was included a specific reference to the environment. Article 11 of the Protocol is in relatively simple terms, but it does deal with both rights and duties. It says everyone shall have the right to live in a healthy environment and to have access to basic public services. The state's parties shall promote the protection, preservation and improvement of the environment. And from this, the text, the judgment develops an elaborate framework of rights and responsibilities, national and transboundary. And it is indeed a, a remarkable example of an environmental, a, a human rights courts developing the framework in a progressive way, which actually encompasses most of the sort of accepted principles of international environmental law. And the court also emphasizes the importance of protection of the environment as an end in itself, quite apart from risk to individual human beings. The same approach is adopted in another um, uh, recent uh, development, that is the proposed Global Pact for the Environment, which was um, produced in France by a, um, a group of experts under the leadership of Laurent Fabius, who was the um, chairman of the Paris negotiations in 2015. And this was had the blessing of President Macron, and it was presented by him to the UN General Assembly in September 2017. It's been subject to discussions within the United Nations since. The ambition, according to the accompanying of material, was for the pact to become, quotes, the cornerstone of international environmental law and to stand alongside the two international governments of 1966 relating to civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights. So establishing, it was said, a third generation of fundamental rights the rights related to environmental protection. So a very ambitious endeavour. I was in fact honoured to be a member of the group of international legal specialists invited to advise on the, the text. And I went to the launch event in the Sorbonne back in 2017. Um, what I think is, is very important about the, the pact is it actually brings together a number of very familiar concepts which one finds in other documents, but, um, such as sustainable development, inter intergenerational equity, polluter pays, and so on. Um, but it does so in a very simple and tangible form. But I think the most important point is the starting point, which emphasises, again, that this is not just about rights, but about the balance of rights and duties, individual and collective. So Article 1 right to a, an ecologically sound environment. Every person has a right to live in an ecologically sound environment, adequate for their health, well-being, dignity, culture and fulfilment. Article 2, duty to take care of the environment. Every state or international institution, every person, natural or legal, public or private, has the duty to take care of the environment. To this end, everybody, everyone contributes at their own levels to the conservation, protection, and restoration of the integrity of the Earth's ecosystem. Now, I like that because it goes beyond the idea that it's just a matter for states. It's something which every person, natural or legal, has an involvement in. And it goes beyond just protection, but restoration of the integrity of the Earth's ecosystem. Now, as I say, that's um, um, progressing. It's, there's been a large measure of international support for the pact within and outside the United Nations, but there's been opposition from some predictable quarters, and so future progress remains uncertain. Now, um, let me come back uh, in conclude, well, uh, 
in conclusion, to the, my hypothetical conversation with the environmental activist on the doorstep of the Supreme Court. Now, she might have asked me to explain what courts like mine were doing in practical terms to enforce environmental rights and with what results. Now, I could have offered some examples. I might have pointed to the order we made in the Supreme Court uh, in 2015 against the government in a case brought by Client Earth, challenging the government's failure to bring pollution levels in certain major urban areas within the mandatory let limits set by the European directives. We ordered the government to produce a revised plan within a specific period and gave liberty to apply to the administrative court for consequential orders. A revised plan was produced, but that was challenged by Client Earth and found wanting by the administrative court. And the court laid down a tight program for its improvement. So far, so good, my activists might have said, but what then? And I would have had to admit that we were not enforcing environmental rights as such, but we were enforcing specific statutory rules laid down by a directive. Okay. So, um, are you all right? And, um, but even in that context, uh, there had been a question whether enforcement was a matter of the European Commission rather than the courts, which we had referred to the European Court. So the whole process had taken rather a long time. The case was started in 2011. And even now, eight years later, it's open to question how much it has achieved in terms of strict compliance. Air pollution in London remains a major issue. I might perhaps have turned our conversation to the courts of the USA and the great case of Massachusetts and the Environmental Protection Agency in 2007. There, as you know, the Supreme Court decided by five to four that the agency's powers under the Clean Air Act extended to greenhouse gas emissions, such as CO2 emissions from motor vehicles. And they held that the, um, there was unchallenged evidence that global warming threatens a precipitate rise in sea levels by the end of the century and severe and irreversible changes to natural ecosystems. And the agency's failure to take any action was held to be arbitrary and capricious and therefore unlawful. Now, that again was not a case about human rights as such. It turned on the construction of the Clean Air Act. But it was very important uh, following the change of administration. It was decided actually under the Bush administration. But then when President Obama get in, got in, it gave him the, the necessary legal tools which he was able to work in the face of a, um, the unlikelihood of getting any actual laws through Congress. And it paved the way for his strong climate change program and for the USA's crucial leadership in the Paris negotiations in 2015. But again, I would have had to admit that subsequent progress has been patchy. The judgment still stands. It has not been questioned in any later cases but it has not prevented the next president reversing the EPA's policy approach and deciding to pull out of the Paris Agreement. Now, you will not find any coherent explanation of this change of view, as far as I can see, anywhere on, in the government or indeed on the EPA website. Curiously, you will find on the website a page headed, quotes, climate change in the United States, benefits of global action. It gives a link to a 2015 report by the Climate Change Impacts and Risk Analysis, CIRA, which it is said shows that global action on climate change will significantly benefit Americans by saving lives and avoiding costly damages across the US economy. But how this is compatible with the decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement is not explained. Another USA case which has attracted a lot of interest was the judgment of Judge Aiken in the case of Juliana v. the USA in 2016 in the US District Court of Oregon. But again, progress has been painfully slow. The plaintiffs were a group of young people alleging specific harm due to the effects of climate change and challenging the federal government's failure to take adequate steps to protect them. 
Judge Aiken dismissed the government's attempt to have the case struck out as disclosing no arguable case. She rejected arguments that these were political questions. She held that the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is fundamental to a free and ordered society and thus protected by the due process clause of the Constitution. The case was supposed to go to a full hearing last autumn, but it was delayed by interlocutory wrangles which went all the way up to the Supreme Court and are still waiting resolution. Now, I'd have had to confess to my activist friend that when one is dealing with issues as complex and wide-ranging as climate change, human rights law is an imperfect tool. In the long run, there is no real alternative to political consensus supported by robust legal frameworks. I, I could have emphasized that in the United Kingdom, we are fortunate the issue has, was long ago taken out of the serious area of serious political controversy by legislation in the form of the Climate Change Act of 2008, which imposes a duty on the Secretary of State to ensure that the net emissions of greenhouse gases for the year 2050 are at least 80% lower than the 1990 baseline. It provides the machinery for the Secretary of State to set statutory carbon budgets for successive five-year periods and it established an independent climate change committee to give expert advice, including on the setting of the carbon budgets. And for the moment, our performance has been on track, although the committee has made clear that more needs to be done for the future. And for the moment, that those issues have not come before the courts in any significant way. Now, as you probably know, last month, the committee advised that to satisfy our Paris commitments, the target in the Act needs to be revised downwards to net zero emissions by 2050. The Act provides a mechanism for that to be done by statutory instrument. And recently, Mrs May, as part of her legacy, announced that, it had, that the government had accepted this advice and would promote the necessary legislation. Now, this announcement attracted criticism on both sides. Some said it was unachievable. Others said it did not go far enough. The BBC reported that the Chancellor of the Exchequer had warned that it would cost £1 trillion by 2050. The Acting Energy Minister, on the other hand, pointed out that this was no more than 1-2% to of the UK's GDP. And others said it was a small price to pay for saving the world. Now, whatever target is proposed, it will undoubtedly attract intense political debate. And I note that this week Ireland also announced it's uh, the launch of its own climate change plan aiming for net zero emissions by 2050. Now, to me as an environmental lawyer and judge, the important point is that in the 2008 Act in the United Kingdom, we have more than political commitments or generalized human rights protection. We have a strong legal framework with clear and enforceable targets based on objective and independent advi expert advice. And I think I would say to my activist friend that whatever else we do by way of test cases such as the Torres Islands case or by way of the sort of protests such as the Extinction Rebellion protests, we need to direct all our efforts to achieving legal regimes across the globe which are effective and um, enforceable and fit for purpose. Now, in this connection, I was delighted to see the announcement um, this week that the UK has reached an agreement with Italy in its bid to host the 26th Conference of the Parties under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, this is a crucial meeting marking the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement and the time for the, quote, global stock take to be undertaken by the Conference of the Parties under Article 14 to assess collective progress towards achieving the purpose of the agreement. Now, it happens to coincide with the US a presidential elections, which gives added piquancy to that particular objective. Now, for me, it's impossible to overestimate the importance of that meeting for the future of the world as we know it. Um, 
as my activist friend would no doubt tell me, the Paris Agreement is far from perfect. But I would reply that from a legal point of view, it's the best thing we have and we have to make it work. Thank you very much.